Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and this is um, a podcast sponsored by the Indiana Women's Action Movement. And um, this is uh, just a huge thrill for me today to be joined by Dr. Jennifer McCormick. Um, you are such a um, vital person in the educational story, at least of the last four years, uh, as you served in the superintendent of schools position, uh, an elected position, and the position that you were elected to as a Republican. And so I first want to ask you if you could give us a little bit more information about your background. Uh, your story is so um, incredible. Um, uh, as to your recent departure from the Republican Party, and so I would just love to hear more about you and how you came to this position. So first of all, thank you for having me back. And I appreciate the work that you're doing to help inform and to advocate for our students and our public schools. So thank you for that. Um, as far as my background goes, I attended public schools um, at Newcastle K through 12. I went on to attend several public universities and became a teacher. I taught for 10 years, both in general education and special education. I was an elementary principal and then went on to serve as a local superintendent for seven and a half years before jumping into that uh, political arena. And I always said I was not a politician. I was an educator that just happened to land there. Um, but I did serve a state superintendent for four years through one term. Um, I'm proud to say that I'm the last um, elected. I wish there were more elected, but it, I am proud to say I was the 44th and the people selected me to do that job. Um, I took it very seriously. I approached it in a very um, nonpartisan, not just bipartisan, but really a nonpartisan that, you know, one for all and all for one for kids. And so that's a little bit about my background, but it's very laden with public school and a lot of philanthropic grew up in a household. That that's what you did. You served and you helped others and you fought for those who needed assistance. And so that brought me to really where I am today. Well, and, um, that's, you know, you mentioned it briefly, the, the notion that now um, one of the latest, I don't know what to call it, bad things, I'll just say, that the supermajority Republican legislature has done to education is to change the superintendent position to a non-elected position, an appointment by the uh, governor. Um, just another really kind of control attack on education. We've seen this now for many years. Um, in, in Indiana, we were one of the leaders in charter schools in the country and really shifting public funds, you know, ultimately from public school to privately operated schools, some for profit, some nonprofit. Um, and, um, and I know that's something that you really worked hard to try to slow down while you were with the superintendent. Um, but now we've got all kinds of new movements uh, to attack public schools. And I really wanna get your insight on that. Um, of course, we know that the last legislative session, um, more opportunities were provided to allow uh, public funds to go to private, religious, or just private for-profit um, schools. And it expanded that opportunity, you know, re I, I, I hate to say all the stages because at first, remember, it was just going to be this innovative thing. And, you know, we're just going to have these few charter schools that we're going to, you know, innovate mm -hmm. and find these great um, educational programs. And then, you know, we can then use them and implement them in the public schools. And it will just be this little kind of, you know, test school. And, and then, of course, you know, it just went from there to, you know, everywhere. And, and then finally now, uh, you know, we, then it was just, oh, just it's for just <laughs> Um, families, you know, so they should have a choice. Well, now, of course, you know, it's expanded to everybody and, um, and all of that public uh, money is going to private schools, which is dangerous. And of course, you know, we know they have separate standards. But um, so now um, the Republican majority, uh, a super majority in Indiana, uh, on a national level too, I think is really putting together this movement now, the latest attack is to upend school boards. So we've seen it. So tell us what your take on uh, take on this is. I, this is just incredible what we're seeing. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So I go back to two of the basic foundations and a lot of people are doing some really great work in this space right now to just our democracy. So let's look at big picture are obviously access to voting and then obviously our votes to count. 
And the other piece of that is, which many would argue is public education. And the super majorities, really red states, really conservative states, and I would lump Indiana right in there with that, are really using every avenue they can. And COVID has presented some opportunities for them to go after that public education piece and set an urgency for change. And it's really sad. We used to have communities that would support their school boards and you wouldn't have much attendance because the trust was there at a school board meeting. They supported their superintendents, they supported their principals. And there's a lot of frustration around just the whole pandemic and how it's been handled. I really think our schools have been put in a horrible, horrible situation, but there are people who have taken advantage of it to uproot public schools and to even uproot the voting issue and to uproot who serves, who is, who is the voice for kids um, through the school boards. And so I do think um, unfortunately, we may see some legislation come that would make you have to declare a political party in order to even run, which right now it's not a partisan. And we always say, you know, it needs to be about kids and not about politics. Um, but I do think some things are happening and things are moving based upon people are going to, legislators are going to take advantage of the situation that you do have just a, an enormous amount of frustration across the state on how the pandemic was handled and very polarizing opinions. And when there's a lack of leadership, it festers out of control. And I think that's what where we are. And it is very unfortunate, but I do think you are correct. Our school boards are definitely at risk right now. That's wild. And so, you know, the other issues too, besides the um, COVID uh, response uh, that are coming up in these uh, attacks on school boards is um, the social emotional learning. Um, you know, I come from early childhood education. So of course, you know, that's my jam as young people say. Um, and uh, so social emotional learning, you know, that's what we did in early childhood. That was our big focus. And so, and, and I had always been a proponent of adding that to K-12 education. I really felt like it was needed. Um, and so, and a lot of that is in response to the COVID um, pandemic because uh, everyone saw, at least at the national level, that children suffered um, emotionally from, you know, being out of school. And now we're seeing these groups of I don't know where they're coming from. It is definitely a national movement. It is not a homegrown movement. That is clear. Um, one simply has to look at the website for uh, some of these organizations to see that this is not a homegrown movement. And they are coming in and they're really um, uh, arguing about social emotional learning. Like that is um, not a good idea suddenly. Um, and it has to do with, you know, of course, this made up issue about critical race theory. Um, which I'm sure you know better than anybody, is not a thing in K-12 education. Um, but it goes beyond that. It's, it's, uh, if, if you've looked at our uh, Indiana State Attorney General's um, parent rights uh, letter, of course, much of it is things that parents have now. They, you know, you know of course, can you, I want to find out what are my kids learning. Well, of course you can do that. That's not, that's not a problem. Um, but a lot of it is also uh, kind of a, you know, a, a motion to say, I don't want my child learning about LGBTQ stuff. And I don't want my child learning about, um, you know, actual racial injustice in this country. Um, so what's your, what is your feeling about those attacks as well? You know, that goes back to it, it starts and stops with leadership. And when we were in office with the Department of Education, we embraced with a lot of external partners at the university level, through organizations, through st other state agencies, a lot of what I'm really proud of, and it was a group team effort by far, it wasn't just me, it was a lot of people that really did some amazing work in the area of SEL, the, the social emotional learning and the behavioral piece. A lot of resources were up, a lot of standards were set that really embraced that. You know, we have some statistics in Indiana that should frighten folks as regarding, you know, kids and suicides that have actually been attempted and suicides that have actually gone through. You know, we have a lot of conversations we can have with mental health and, and access to good, solid mental health for all ages. Um, but we were really having some good, honest conversations to really look at that data and say, what are we going to do about this? This trend is out of control, and you certainly don't want to be top three in the nation in the statistics that we're in. But you have to have some leadership that will support that. Since we've gone out of office, out of the department, 
those resources are not even um, accessible to schools. And so there's a lot of pieces to this that are not being, if schools were empowered and now they're being restricted and it is a national movement. You are correct. People came out of the woodwork. A lot of it's coming out of the Chicago area, some groups, um, some of it's coming from Illinois or uh, Ohio. So there are different areas that those groups are coming from. They're sending some quite interesting, nasty uh, demands to directly to teachers with uh, canned letters. And, and it's not healthy. At some point, Indiana is going to wake up and say, you know, either we address this in an honest fashion or we listen to the political posturing of what's happening by the extreme right. And it's just a dangerous place to be. But your ki the kids are the ones who are caught in the middle of it. What's unfortunate is educators get a little nervous about what can I teach to what can I not teach? What are the consequences to that? And some of that's very muddy right now. And that's exactly where they want us to be because when you are unclear of consequences, people become paralyzed. So you know, you have a lot of schools that are doing some really amazing work and are gonna proceed and say, we're gonna do it because it's the right thing to do. But you also have some that are starting to slow that train because of hesitancy. And I, and I understand why they just don't know the unknown consequences. And in Indiana sometimes, those can be quite heavy. We did see that just recently. Um, and I, I'm, I apologize for not remembering which school district it was, uh, but uh, wait, it's almost coming to me. It's near Fort Wayne, but not Fort Wayne. Um, a school corporation there um, uh, had a complaint about a teacher who hung a rainbow flag outside uh, her classroom door uh, to indicate that this was a safe space to talk about if you had uh, questions about LGBTQ uh, issues um, or wanted to talk to someone about it, this was a safe space. Uh, and a parent complained uh, that there was this uh, flag hanging there. And so the school corporation took it up and lumped that into a category of what they called political speech and, uh, and voted at least, and I don't think it's, it's really finalized yet. I think there's still an opportunity to hopefully come, you know, sanity to, to prevail. But at this point, um, the school is um, removing those sorts of things um, and not allowing what they're calling political speech, which is just shocking to me. Um, you know, I think that issue, LGBTQ uh, plus issues have long since been accepted as really non-political, really just about who you are, who you love. And um, and, it, and it's frightening to see that kind of being pulled back into controversy. So, um, so we did see that, and that was unfortunate. And um, again, it's the it's the movement you you just described too. It's this kind of out of state, nationalized information uh, that's coming into Indiana. Um, we saw this in the last election too in Indiana. Uh, as you know, I worked with a, a lot of terrific, outstanding um, state legislative candidates, and. Uh, that is one of the lessons we learned was that we were fighting against a nationalized messaging uh, that was just somehow, it felt like an insulated stream of this messaging and information coming from the national level to voters in Indiana. And it was really difficult to get, to get through to people, to get through to voters and really just get to know them and to, you know, and to get them to know the positions of our candidates. So, um, so, uh, you know, next year is an election year. And so um, I would love to hear your commentary on what you think we should look for in this next election cycle. But, but first, I want to ask you to tell us the story about your, your uh, you know, exit from the Republican Party. Um, I think that was big, quite recent in the last six months or so, or a year. And so, I mean, that's an important story. I think you came in as a Republican, you tried to work with Republicans, and you had an authentic struggle, uh, you know, based on solid issues um, that I think led you to make this change. And so I would like for you to talk more about that. Yeah, so, you know, I can't, when I ran for office, uh, people who had looked at my voting past, um, because that's all political, or it's all public, you know, it was very checkered. I had always voted for the leader that I felt could get the job done. If they were Democrat, they were Democrat. If they were Republican, they're Republican. But I always voted for the leader that I thought was making some sense, that had some good ideas, that understood having, having a good team around them, and that was people-centered. 
And so I was very open about that. And, but when I, you know, you have to declare an office to run, I declare, you know, declared Republican um, to, to run. And so what I learned quickly is there's such a push and I don't know if this is true a statewide to the local Republicans, but such a Republican push as a party uh, that's really a struggle against a lot of things that I uh, held as a value. For instance, public education, health uh, access and affordable health care, you know, taking care of infrastructure, taking care of those who need it the most. And I was watching what was happening at the federal level with uh, President Trump. I was watching how people were supporting his actions and behaviors and rhetoric. And then their messaging was getting, in my opinion, more and more ridiculous. And I was like, who, who would be associated with this? So I struggled with that because I knew that that association when you're in a political office is huge. But probably the thing that sent that over the top was when I decided to do a bipartisan um, tour with Senator Melton. And he's from Gary, Indiana, serves on the Ed Commission and has always been very active in supporting public schools. He's like, let's go across the state and ask some questions. Well, that didn't take very long for the Republican Party to jump all over that, that there were alternative motives. And at the time, Senator Melton was not running for governor. I was not interested in getting on a ticket of any sort. I was just trying to be part bipartisan given what was happening at the national level. I thought it was a good, um, it was a, a good role model piece for people to see that it can happen and it should happen. And this is how it could look. We had great turnout, great feedback. People really appreciated it, except for the Republican Party leadership. And they quickly came out and questioned my, you know, my Republicanism and, and you know, my the whole thing. And it just got ridiculous. And honestly, it, it didn't bother me because I didn't care. You know, I, I was more concerned about serving kids and serving the people that had elected me. And I wasn't in there to make friends. And I certainly wasn't looking to you know, get a gold star from the Republican Party. So I simply didn't care. And I, we moved on and, and they just really never let it go. And I never really had a huge support from the party to begin with because I was too pro-public education. And it just, it, it accelerated. I was very open to whomever wanted to come into the Department of Education and ask questions. I didn't care about political affiliation. We provided data to everyone. And that is not the way that is that it works. And I learned that quickly. So just looking at the totality of it, I just had to question like, am I going to be affiliated with this? And um, for me, it was an easy, I, there's an alternative to that. And it was an easy, the Democrats were doing good work. I, I loved who they were running, some really great candidates. Um, there, there was a lot of alignment, you know, as far as my ideology. And so I, I was excited and I thought, you know, I, I need to <laughs> need to make that switch. So for me, it was an easy decision and I, I don't look back and I, I'm hoping that the Democrats can gain some momentum. Um, Indiana's hard, um, but they've got some great candidates and keeping people out and getting some fundraising going and some messaging. And I think they're on the right track. Oh, that's awesome. So, so tell us a little bit more about what you um, foresee for the 2022 um, elections. Yeah, I think you hit on one already. I think we're going to probably see something with school boards. I'm not sure what exactly that will look like. And you know, what's really unfortunate is I've had some school board higher up uh, members who are actively involved at the state level. And they're like, you know, look, this is retaliatory. This is based upon we did resolutions at the local level and people, the legislators are upset. And I thought, how sad that school boards exercise the right of what they had to represent their kids in which the people voted them to do. And now there's backlash and they're threatening to take away their powers or to take away their authority or to make them declare a, par a party to even run. It's hard enough to get people to, do, to, to run for school board, let alone when you throw a political twist in that. That is not, there's not a lot of appetite for that. So that piece, unfortunately, I, I'll be shocked if we don't see something come up. Um, you know, it's not a financial, it's not a budget year. So that's always quite interesting, but they're going to have to tackle something with, I would think with teacher licensing, because we are still operating in such a shortage, just like the rest of the industries across the, across the board. But when you are having school start school with, you know, 15 teachers down and there's no subs, it, it is beyond a crisis. 
that I think we're going to see something happen in. I do think there, there's going to be somewhat of a push, hopefully, from some support. But also, I think the unfortunate thing is the counter to that regarding SEL. I think something will, will come up surrounding that. Um, some voter pieces, I still think that's going to hang out there as far as, um, you know, how, how does that look around um, voter education, civil, civil uh, rights education, some of that, the pieces to that, it'll, I think that's going to get quite interesting. So it, it's going to be, I think, a, a, a fast session, but I also think too, it's going to be latent in a lot of things we're seeing at the national level. So you know, it's, it's, people are doing a lot of homework, getting geared up, but I think it's, I don't know if it's going to be exactly kind to public schools. And so, um, can I ask, what do you see as your role in 2022? So for me, I've always said I will help, you know, obviously not a lobbyist, but I've always said I will answer questions and I will help. My big concern right now is, which is no surprise to people who are in the public school trenches, is I think there's a couple key points that we should be paying attention to. And I think legislation could help because I don't think you can legislate your way to state successes. I think there are ways it can help, but we are so policy heavy in Indiana and many of them are unproductive and have a lot of unintended or intended consequences. <laughs> Um, but I think tracking like the class of 2020 for the economic workforce piece, the class of 2025, which are our current freshmen, I think you have a whole group of kids in there that would be a fascinating study regarding they have now heard the message loud and clear. Do not trust your teachers. Do not trust your superintendents or your school board or your policemen or your doctors or your scientists or your ministers. The list goes on. And we, we sit and we yeah. think back at that. And it's like that that formative years of they've been through three consecutive disruptions of school years that freshman class needs to have an interesting study piece our fifth grade that the current fifth grade the class of 2029 because they got transferred into content under very difficult circumstances and then our class of 2031 which is our current third graders who are reading foundations i'm hearing a lot of concerns so just that academic focus piece related to a lot of things as far as learning loss um trying to help with some of that leading into that 2022 is like let's be smart about this you know if we're going to have legislation let's be smart so giving a lot of input and feedback and trying to support really great candidates and um, trying to, I'm getting ready to speak to the Henry County uh, Democrats. And I've had a lot of people say, hey, we don't live there, but we're coming. And I think that's good too, just trying to get people energized to, to listen and make sure people are informed. And I'll continue to work hard for, for our educators and for the kids and just our public schools as a whole. Well, that is wonderful to hear. Um, you have such uh, intelligence and background and experience and, and really innovation um, to bring to this topic and to Indiana. So um, I, I, I hate to do it, but I always feel like I have to thank people for staying, staying in Indiana. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being in Indiana. Uh, thank <laughs> so, you. Oh yeah. So um, I, I guess I wanna ask you too, um, you know, I, what do you see if you, you know, if you were uh, this, you know, state superintendent of schools, um, and we had a, you know, a, a, an administration that supported you, you know, what would be your, what would be your next step? I think the potential for that is is um, could be amazing. I mean, I, I know in Indiana, you know, careful what you wish for. The governor and the legislators really wanted that Department of Education and that K-12 responsibility under their umbrella. And, and they got it and it's there, but what are we hearing from them? So I've not heard the governor talk about K-12 education unless I've completely missed it in some time. And so where are those conversations? In, in fact, about just like the grades that I just brought up. I mean, there's so many conversations that should be happening with the, the help of mental health experts, with academic experts, with a lot of people that are really, really smart inside of Indiana and outside of Indiana to say, we can't sit around and wait on consequences and, and see what happens. We, can all, we need to look at what are we projecting to happen or what are some ways we can help with that. But such an amazing opportunity to support schools, to guide schools, to make sure they have the, the, the resources they need, but also just to inform 
the average citizen of what is happening in education in Indiana. And I just, if it were a great alignment and there was a, a real commitment and priority from a governor on K-12, I think the potential could just, it could be quite amazing for any state where it's done well. And I've seen it happen and it, it's quite impressive, but uh, too often, unfortunately, I've seen it where if someone gets that power over K-12, it's pretty suppressed. Um, out of sight, out of mind, because you need to pu push the privatization. And that is very unfortunate. Right. So, and one thing we also um, didn't talk about much, and I would like to get your opinion on, is really um, teacher education. Um, you know, as you mentioned, big shortage, big shortage everywhere, big shorter shortage, like you said, in all industries right now of uh, staff. Um, but at the last uh, session, I believe there was kind of a loosening of requirements, um, allowing teachers to get their license uh, a little easier. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I may not have passed, and you know, but I remember a uh, discussion of that sort of legislation. And um, and so I wonder what your comments are on that whole kind of strategy to to increase the number of teachers that we have, and you know, what would be your strategy? Yeah, I think it starts with higher education and some really hard conversations about I don't want to bring down the rigor of any program because it does no one any good, not the person in the class, not the educator or the students or the families or the community. However, we're in a situation where we have no one. We have no one who's formally trained. We don't have subs who's even who sometimes are slightly trained. I mean, we are very, very limited on who's playing a big role in the education of our kids. And sometimes that works out, but more times than not, it, it's not a good situation. When you put someone in who says, I wasn't very good in math in high school, and you're like, well, you're the calculus teacher for a bit. You can only imagine how that's going to play out. And so, but that's unfortunately, I hear stories like that all the time where someone will tell me I was put in a physics class and I didn't, I didn't even take physics. I've never taken physics. And so, but you, when you have to hope for the best because there's just no one applying or no one in the trench or no one even in the pipeline. It's a problem. So a real candid conversation with higher ed, and I'm not putting the blame there. I just think it's going to take a partnership to say, we're going to have to completely rethink this where we keep it to a quality program, but let's be realistic where we can get some folks into those classrooms um, that have knowledge about content and enjoy kids. That's step one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And also understand what's at stake. And so I, I think it, it is, and Indiana is not alone, but boy, it's, it's, it's a real, it's, I would argue it's beyond a crisis at this point. It's, it's pretty bad. Man. All right. So, okay, great. So um, thank you so much. Um, I love talking to you. You are such a wealth of great information and I've just so appreciated you. I, I remember the first time I saw you speak um, once you became a superintendent, I knew nothing about you. And I thought it was a Republican in there. And I was so impressed and I was, I was just blown away by your, um, your commitment to data, your commitment to studying and your commitment to really just bettering education for kids. So, um, so I'm so happy to get this chance to talk to you, and I really hope to see more of you uh, in Indiana and um, and in politics. I think this is a you know this is a great opportunity for you, and I think a great opportunity for our state. Well, I appreciate it. I, I believe in kids. I believe in what we're trying to accomplish with public education, the inclusivity and the role it plays in just our democracy. And so I'll continue to fight for that. But I do appreciate the kind words and appreciate everybody who's in it for the good fight. All right, great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McCormick. I hope we'll get to talk to you again soon. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right.